Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is Paul August and it's been a heck of a crazy year. So a lot of you are wondering, how do I get back on the wagon? How do I start up everything? How do I get back and get more customers? How do I uh, get more employees? Get the customers that you lost to come back and all that crazy stuff. Well, I'm going to be sharing a tool with you that I've used to grow my company. And now, guys, I'm a pretty small company. We started back in 2015. That's when we were officially open for business. And I still consider myself a small company. And we finally got these tools. I finally learned and understood these tools only a few years ago. And since I've been doing that, our company has been growing. And even with this corona thing happening right now, we've been able to actually beat last year still. Not by a large margin, but we still beat last year. Recently, we just put on six new team members to our team. And it's like, how do we get customers for them? Well, we don't have that problem anymore. And I'm going to be showing you the exact same tools that I use. So let's jump right into it. A lot of times I find that cleaning business owners are afraid of numbers. And I was exactly on that boat. I was a cleaning business owner that was terrified of numbers. Put a number in front of me, I was going to run. If it was tax season, I was going to run. If I had to tell you what my client cost per acquisition or any of those big fancy number terms were, I would run. But over time, I started understanding that there are key numbers in your business that really drives it. And if you understood how these numbers work, and if you were able to track and measure that number, you could explode your cleaning company. And that's exactly what I'm going to be sharing with you guys. But first and foremost, who am I and why the heck should you even listen to me? Again, my name is Paul August, and I own Home Plus Cleaning, a cleaning company. And also, I help cleaning business owners grow their customer base as well as hire and, and recruit the best team members for their company. So we're based out of Massachusetts, and we've been in business since 2015. Now, since starting my cleaning company, I've been able to do some things that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do if it was not for my cleaning company. I have my pilot's license, which I just got on May 20th. I just uh, ended up getting my pilot's license. I'm officially a pilot. I've been able to travel with my family, uh, friends, and just kind of live a freedom-based lifestyle. I always tell everyone, I don't build my lifestyle around my business. I build my business around my lifestyle. And I really wanted a business that wasn't going to hinder me from traveling, which is one of the things I love to do or pick up new hobbies and just have fun. As long as that business was not doing that, then I was happy to be in that business. But unfortunately, a lot of business takes our time. So it's important that we make sure that we build that business to suit our lifestyle. What's on our agenda for today? We're going to talk about the most important numbers in your business as it pertains to marketing. We're going to talk about firing customers. That's a scary thing for a lot of people. They don't want to fire customers, and I completely understand that. And we're going to talk about the bullshit. We're going to find out which marketing source is going to be the bull that's pulling your money cart and which one is going to be pulling it down. For those of you who stick around to the end, we're going to be talking about something called the hidden customer. For each hidden customer I have, I'm able to put $16,000 at the end of the year in my pocket because of this. And I'm going to be sharing with you who the heck the hidden customer is. Before I jump into that, I want to ask you a question. How much is too much to get one new recurring customer? How much should you be willing to pay to attain one new recurring customer? Go ahead, answer that out loud. If you know the number, just say it. Well, I always thought I knew this number, and then I found out there was more to this number than I really understood. To really answer this question, we have to start with the right questions. And here's the, here are the right questions. What's one re new recurring customer worth to my business? You have to know that. How many customers do I actually need or want? You might not want to build a crazy big cleaning company that has 300, 400 recurring customers. You might want something that gives you a comfortable lifestyle where you don't need to necessarily be at the office every day and deal with certain stresses. Where are your leads coming from? And last but not least, what is your damn cost per acquisition? How much does it take you right now to acquire one new recurring customer? So before I go on, I want to introduce you guys to the Sues. The Sues are my ideal client, and I've created a profile 
of my ideal client, which we share with our management team. Everyone knows who the Sues are. Now we have multiple Sues in our company, but the Sues really, we're trying to make them make up 100%, but right now they'd make up 20%. However, they make up about 80% of our revenue throughout the entire company. The Sues are between the ages of 45 to 55 years old. They're married with usually two children. I just threw boys out there. I ended up getting all girls, but <laughs> just threw boys out there. Their total income is between eighty dollars to $150,000 a year. That's combined income in the family. Lives in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home in an upper-middle-class area. How much is Sue worth? Well, to me and my company, Sue brings in $3,500 annually. That is her annual sales. Now, the gross margin on Sue is $1,575. So basically, what that is, is after I paid someone to clean Sue's house, after I paid the workman's comp and the employee, employer taxes on that person cleaning it, cleaning Sue's house. So all my costs of goods sold, we have $1,575 left towards the company. Now that money can be divided into marketing. It can be divided into different operational expenses and as well as profit. I should have said profit first. For those of you who read that book, profit's not something you make, it's something that you take. Sue has a lifetime value for my company of $4,725 because the average customer stays with us for three years. So how much can I afford to pay for a suit? So I find myself at a mastermind group in LA and this question comes up, how much can you afford to pay for one new customer? And I blurted out my answer. Well, the answer I heard was shaking in a sense because I was upset. I said, no way. Here's what I was told. You should be paying, you should be willing to spend up to 15 to 30% of the customer's lifetime value or their gr annual gross margin on a customer. And I lost it. I said, no way. That is ridiculous. I'll never spend that. Could you imagine a cleaning customer paying $1,417.50 to get that customer? That seems ridiculous. Or if you're, you have bad retention, you're paying up to $472.50. Now, believe it or not, I've seen this number um, many times. So this seems like more of a norm. But what's up with this big number here? Well, the thing is, marketing doesn't stop when you acquire a customer. Although it is your acquisition budget, it is also your retention budget. And retention is key to getting the most out of your marketing dollars. It is easier to keep a customer that already knows, likes, and trusts you than spending the money to acquire a new customer. But unfortunately, a lot of people will spend $200, $250 over and over and over again to get a new customer. But once they get that customer, they become a recurring customer, they hardly want to spend $100 in retention. Now, if you're thinking this budget is too high, let me ask you this. So if you know the average sales for a customer, Ours is 3,500. What we did was basically we took our average sales ticket, which is $165 per cleaning, and we multiplied it by the amount of time the customer uses us. And we found an average between all of our customers. So it ends up being 3,500. If you know that number, 3,500, and I say, hey, I will give you $3,500 if you give me 200. Would you do it? Well, how about if I said, if you give me 500? I'll give you 2,500. What about if I said 2,000? Well, if you're looking at this number, you're saying, well, Paul, this number here says I shouldn't go above this, but 2,000 is still not a bad price to pay to get 3,000, right? Well, wrong, because a lot of times we forget our time and our time is very important. The time you spend to get that person, you need to factor that in as well. So how many customers do you want monthly? Is it 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? To answer this question, we also need to backtrack. We need to understand our closing rate. What's our closing rate? Every single time the phone rings and we speak to a customer, what percentage of them are saying, yes, I want your service, I want to do business with you? What are conversions? Every single time somebody goes to your website, how many times are they actually picking up the phone to call? 
How many times are they filling out a form? And what's your cost per click? How much is it costing you every single time they click on your website or your ad? Let's say you decided you wanted 20 customers per month. So every single month, if you're running a solo model, you probably need to hire one person, really two people, right? To service 20 customers a month, just because one of them won't work out. Every single time you pick up the phone, 50% of the people say yes. So now we know we need to get 40 people to call you only 10% of the people that are coming to your website are actually taking action. So now we know we need to get 400 clicks to our website just to get 40 calls, just to get 20 people to say yes. And at $10 a click, that's $4,000 a month on your marketing. Now that can get very expensive. How can we drive that price down? You're thinking the leads a week. The leads are not necessarily weak. What's weak is the method that we're using. We're using this cookie cutter approach to everything. Our marketing, our message, our sales script. It's from one company to another and we never make sure that it's branded to our company. So you wanna open a more relationship with clients than you need to be able to stretch your marketing dollars. And how do you do that? Well, you need to audit your marketing platform. It is necessary that you understand where your leads are coming from and which source is the best source. Everything changes rapidly in marketing and especially today online. Now, some principles are fundamental and have been here for years, but when you look at things like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Yelp, uh, Home Advisor, YouTube, Instagram, these things literally have not been here for that long and they're rapidly changing. So today, Google might be amazing and I love Google for marketing. I run Google ads, I run the Google local services ads, but tomorrow there might be somebody that bumps Google off. So it's, it's important that I'm constantly measuring and auditing Google to make sure that it's important. So how do you audit your marketing platform? You look at how many customers are coming in from each platform. And you have to ask that question, where did you find us? That is a very, very important question. And how many of those you're actually converting and how much did you spend on that? Second, you need to drive more qualified prospects. The reason I focus on the SUS, I am hyper, hyper focused on targeting one type of customers one type of customer. Now, yes, we do have other customers. We have customers in their 30s. We have customers in their uh, 60s and up. But I want to focus on my best customer and get more customers like that. Because those customers, I find, complain less. They pay more. And they rarely skip. So you need to drive more qualified prospects. When someone wants to do business with you, here's what goes to their head. Can you help me? How do you do it? What's different about you? How much? How long? When? And are you the best value for me? If all those things check out, they're going to do business with you. The message needs to match the marketing. So when they find you online, everything needs to sync up to what you say over the phone and the kind of service they receive from your team members. Now, many people will say marketing and sales are two different things, but the truth of the matter is they're practically the same thing. And if your marketing message doesn't match your sales script, then there's going to be a problem. Back to what we were saying about attracting the right type of customers. A lot of times we'll put ads online that says affordable house cleaning and somebody calls us and we're not affordable. Or maybe we'll present ourselves as an elite cleaning service that caters to busy professionals. And the minute somebody calls, we're already thrown out and offering discounts. You're casting this wide net into the ocean and just trying to get anyone that comes in. And early on in the business, it made sense. Hey, let me get someone. Somebody has money. Let me get it. It doesn't matter. But over time, you'll realize that it's more important to focus on the best type of customers, the one that are looking for your service. So when you present yourself as a professional, they call you, they hear a professional, they go to your website, they see a professional. When someone comes in, they are properly dressed in a company uniform and present themselves as a professional. And you have to ask for referrals. You have to ask for referrals every single chance you get. Ask for them often. Get your customers to become 
your fans that rave about you and your marketing source. Now you can only grow a company so big with word of mouth, but believe me, it's tremendous what word of mouth can do and don't shy away from it. Story time. So this guy goes to his marketing manager and he's like, hey, you gave me this budget. You told me to get 20 customers. Guess what I was able to do with the budget? I ended up getting 30 customers. Now this guy is so happy. He's like, this is going to be awesome. I think I'm going to raise the budget and I'm going to be able to grow the company and get more customers. Market manager looks at him and says, great, I'm reducing your budget. Here's the thing, guys. When your marketing is working efficiently, sky's the limit. You can hire as often as you want, and you can get as many customers as you want. But that doesn't mean you should reduce it. If your plan is growth, you should not reduce that budget and say, I'm going to work with less since I was able to do more with less. Now, that's okay if that's not your plan. Your plan is not to grow. Your plan is to stay medium, comfortable, and whatnot. That's one thing. But if you're looking to grow, you need to invest in marketing. And unfortunately, a lot of cleaning business owners don't see marketing as an investment. They see it as an expense. And marketing is typically the first thing that goes when we're trimming down on on the fat. And then we start wondering, well, why why is our company getting small? We're losing more customers due to due to attrition naturally and we're not putting in the marketing to supplement for that and to also grow how do you increase your referral and retention in your company you have to have a great referral and retention program and i think we've done a very good job with our retention program and um, our referral program here's one referral program that i'll share with you guys and when we instituted this i believe it was within two weeks we got eight new recurring customers just from referrals alone If you're willing to spend $250, $300 per customer on Google, don't be afraid to give that to your customer as a reward. Imagine, the other day I was online, and I believe it was on a Cleaners Connect page or something of that nature. Someone mentioned how they don't give any kind of referrals, and they basically kind of threw a customer out because the customer had asked for a kickback for referral. Now, I fully understand that circumstance. At the same time, a referral weighs more than a Google lead. It's not a cold lead anymore. I would call it a hot lead. If someone is hanging out with me and I tell them, hey, you got to check out this movie, they're more likely to check it out So what we've done is created this postcard and we used to leave it at every single person's house after cleaning. It says, um, do you know about our amazing referral program? $150 Visa gift card or $200 in cleaning for weekly or biweekly service. So whoever gets a weekly or biweekly service, you would get $150 Visa gift card if that's your choice or $200 in cleaning if they became a recurring customer. If they became a monthly recurring customer, so every four weeks, we would give them $75 gift card or $100 in cleaning. Now, this works amazing, but it's important that you're not sending, us, sending this out all the time because over time, we just train them to ignore us. So if you start seeing the same thing, same thing over and over again, it becomes background noise. Retention is everyone's job in our company. We talk about this all the time with our team members in our team meeting. Our team members, and I don't want to say spies because they're not going in drawers looking for things, but they're paying attention and making sure that they're updating notes. So our team members talk, tell us about family births, any kind of deaths in the family, any kind of promotions, awards, accolades, a, a student just graduated, a child just graduated from high school, or college. We want to know about these things because we have a list of our best customers in our office and every single person in our organization knows these are our best customers. And we want to make sure that we do our best to retain those customers. Those are the customers that complain the least, refer to the most. These are our best customers. The speed we correct problems. Guys, it is important. It is important. It's an important retention tool. There was a time where we we had messed up a wolf range and we automatically called this lady. And the range was five thousand dollars. We called her and we were out there. We already called our insurance company ready to fix that. I know business owners sometimes are a little reluctant. They don't want to accept responsibility for something. It's important to investigate absolutely so that you're not taken advantage of, but don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm on top of this. We're calling our insurance company. We're going to find out what's going on. I apologize for this. And if it's our fault, we're going to make sure that we take care of it. 
do not be afraid to do that. That is a great retention tool. And that customer is still with us today and refers us after we messed up a $5,000 range. Dinner for two. Now you're probably thinking, I'm not giving my customer dinner for two. Keep in mind, if a customer is paying you $5,000 a year, $4,000 a year, or more, some customers are paying more, what's $100 dinner for two for them? A random gift saying, hey, thank you very much. We appreciate, we appreciate your patronage. Um, we wanted you to enjoy this dinner for two at so-and-so restaurant. And sometimes you can find out what their favorite restaurants are, or you can do this and you can strategically partner up with the restaurant where you send your customers to. And that hundred dollar gift card just became an $80 gift card, but it's a hundred dollar value to the customer. But the value that it creates for the customer aside from the monetary value is amazing. And I think this has helped us tremendously. Now, we're not telling you, hey, all 250 of your clients, you need to go ahead uh, and send them a $100 gift card. That's absurd. But again, this is where I stress the importance of having a, a high client list, the most important people in your organization. You make sure that you take care of them. Massage for two, something like that, where you partner up with a massage therapist. Social media shout outs. How about dropping a $5 Starbucks card every single time they mention you on their community page? What does that take? Now, I told you guys, if you stuck with me towards the end, I was going to talk to you about the hidden customer. So the hidden customer is by far my favorite marketing customer. And I've created ads to really get me some more hidden customers because I found that if I have the right hidden customers, then everything comes into play and it's just easier to scale. So meet Kellyanne. Kellyanne is 21 to 35 years old, lives with her girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, sometimes parent. Income is 20 to $30,000 a year, lives in a one bedroom, one bath apartment in a lower income neighborhood. Not necessarily always lower income, but do you want a Kellyanne as a customer? Would you spend $3,000 to get a Kellyanne that's aggressive, right? $3,000 to get a Kellyanne. Would you spend that? Well, let me tell you who Kellyanne is. Kellyanne pays you $80,811.82 a year. That's what Kellyanne pays my business, more than any of our customers. Per year, after our cost of goods sold to the business, she's bringing in $44,446.50. Personally, Kellyanne is worth $16,162.36 to me. Kellyanne are your team members. The Kellyannes are your team members. Now, how did I come up with this number? It's simple. Let's assume that you're running a solo team model. And you can do this if you're running a team model as well. So a solo uh, cleaner model or a team model. But I run a solo cleaner model, and this is how I was able to determine the value of our team members. So we give automatically two weeks vacation and we assume someone's gonna take a week off. So let's just say they're sick. So over the court period of time, they're gonna have five days off over the, um, a year just because of their children being sick or whatever the, the situation might be. So our average sales ticket is 165. So if a team member does one house, the house is $165. Now, our team members do two houses a day on a minimum. They work five days a week. And again, assuming that they're only working, they're getting five days off because they're sick, unexcused time, and they're taking two weeks off of vacation, they're working 49 weeks a year. So if I multiply that by 49, I come up with $80,850. So if I minus 55%, this is how much is left for the company after I pay them and cover all the costs of goods sold. $44,467.50. So I really want you guys to think about that the next time you're saying you don't want to spend on Indeed to recruit or you don't want to create a Google ad that sends them to a landing page that retargets to them on Facebook with a video. I want you to think about that the next time you don't want to spend and contribute to recruiting what you're actually missing out on. Take your time, 
invest in your team members and recruit the best people. Because if you have the right people in the right seats, everything falls into place in your company and you can scale that company to new heights. So here's what I want to do for you guys. I want to share with you on my website, augustglobal.com slash made summit 2020. It's actually a form, a sheet that you can download. And I'm going to leave a video on that page as well, where you can actually determine the customer lifetime value. So you'll be able to determine the lifetime value on your customer based on how many times they referred you based on, um, how much, I mean, how much money they pay and you'll be able to find an average there as well. Guys, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, reach out to me at augustglobal.com or you can reach out to me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Paul August. August like the month with the letter E at the end, official. And I'm happy to answer any questions and just chat with you guys. Take care, everyone. Have a great, blessed year. And with whatever happens, just know that everything is going to work in your favor as long as you stay optimistic, persistent, and work hard and smart.